Good afternoon everyone, Mark Reed here from Lauded Solicitors. I'm a solicitor at the firm, as I'm sure some of our listeners are already aware. Um, and I was just engaging in a conversation with my colleague Samuel, and we were discussing something that I thought was probably more appropriate to discuss with, while hitting the record button and uh, actually making it into a, uh, a sort of short podcast. So here we are, Samuel, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you hot? It's very hot over here on the Isle of Wight, isn't it? It is a hot day. It is, it is. But we, um, I think then, therefore, it's important for us to just stop, take stock, think of how lucky we are to be on the island, but also reflect on certain aspects of our week where, uh, legally speaking, it might be beneficial to our listeners. So, part 36. What on earth is part 36? Is it something that you think you can give a very brief overview of? Um, and, uh, and why do you think it's important? Well, part 36 is an offer to settle a claim, or part of a claim. It's called a part 36 offer because it has to comply with part 36 of the civil procedure rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so there, I mean, let's be honest, if you want to make an offer to someone, you make an offer to someone. Um, if, if, if it's got to comply with part 36 of the civil procedure rules, therefore, it is obviously not just a standard offer to the other side. So let's just take it back a step. So we're engaging in litigation. We've already tried to try and settle things and say to the other side, um, either through us or personally through your, your client, that you, um, you know, the only way that you're willing to settle this without taking further action is if they agree to pay the following sums or agree to do the following, whatever it may be. They refuse, you then have to take further action, you have to send a letter of claim, which obviously has to, I say obviously, has to comply with the pre-action protocol um, of conduct um, and conduct. And, and this, this means that it has to be able to provide all of the background to the dispute, it has to be able to provide the law, it has to then be able to provide what your client's position is and obviously it has to point to the, you know, the different points of dispute and say why it's legally applicable for them to um, actually you know, uh, end this dispute in such a way. And then a conclusion that is going to set out what the next steps are if they don't agree to do so. So they then come back with their thoughts. They say, no, we don't agree with what you're saying because of the following reasons. We go back and then they come back. And it's a game of table tennis, back and forth, back and forth, all on a pre-action basis. And then suddenly it gets to a point where you've exhausted that pre-action communication. So you then have to issue proceedings. You then have to go forward on a, uh, you know, have a claim drafted and the particulars of the claim, the pleadings everything and then a defense comes round you know I'm speaking you know here generally and quite quickly because it's not the purpose of this podcast but it is important to understand the basic principles of you know going through the proceedings so you can understand that there's a big piece in the middle that also needs to happen and that of course is trying to negotiate to keep things out of court is there a way where the parties can sit down um, using ADR, you know, some form of mediation to try and settle the dispute without having to go with really disproportionate costs, legal costs, into a courtroom to sort of thrash it out in court. And what the courts will say is, yes, you absolutely need to comply with the overriding objective, which is to that the court must be a last resort. So what is it you've done to try and settle it? And then the parties will say, OK, well, we've, you know, we've, we've given our reasons here on open correspondence. But also what they're not able to say to the court until the end is that they've engaged in offers to settle on a without prejudice basis. That means it's shielded from the court until the end. And then at the end, the court can then consider who's made what offer, which side has made what reasonable offer or unreasonable offer. And then there will be cost consequences as a result of that. And one way of being able to put an offer in is what Samuel was just explaining there, which is, of course, to make an offer which is um, uh, made under Part 36 of the Civil Procedure Rules. So, Sam, I've just given that nutshell there to bring it up to that point. But there's a lot more to it to that. So what do you mean by it has to be um, you know, compliant with these, uh, you know, the rules there? Well, it has to be in writing, it has to specify a period that's no less than 21 days. 
in which the offer can be accepted. Yeah. It has to state exactly whether it relates to the whole of the claim or just part oh. of the claim. Okay, so just pause there a second then. So those, those things you've said there. So it has to be in writing. So that means that I can't, on behalf of my client, pick up the phone to the other side and say, hello, um, I am instructed to um, make your client an offer under part 36 because I'm saying it to this person over the phone. I would have to then follow it up with writing, in writing. So that you, you may as well do it in writing in the first place. You also say that there's a minimum period of time that the other side has to be able to consider that. And that's a minimum of 21, 21 days? days? 21 days. Right, okay. Um, now that third point that you raised there was? It has to state whether it relates to the whole of, of the course. claim or just part of the claim or to a particular issue. Okay, so that's interesting in itself because of course, as far as your client may be concerned, let's say that you act on behalf of the claimant and it's important to, for us to distinguish this point because in actual fact, you could um, act for the defendant and still make an offer to settle under part 36. But let's just say that you act for the claimant. You look at a situation, you say, well, no, the whole thing is a dispute, everything. It's just one dispute. But in actual fact, when you break it down, there's lots of aspects. And there may be parts whereby the defendant is able to look at it and say, I'm willing to settle this point here, this point here, and this point here within the whole claim. But in actual fact, I still, I'm just not willing to accept that. I'm not willing to agree to that. And there is no way that I can make an offer you know, that is able to... Um, you know, to, to settle all of these points. This still needs to be addressed. But these points over here, I think I can make an offer that is reasonable. So that's why they have to identify whether it's the whole claim or part of the claim. Okay, sorry, carry on. Well, then the next state needs to state is whether it takes into account any counterclaim. So it needs to state whether it takes into account any counterclaim. So we've made a claim, we act for the claimant, that goes to the defendant. The defendant then considers the situation and they say, this is not as clear cut as the claimant is making out. And in actual fact, not only am I gonna defend this claim, but I'm also going to make a claim against the claimant. Okay, so that's called a counterclaim. Okay, so that means that within the terms of the part 36 rules, if you're going to make an offer, you're saying that it has to be an offer for the whole claim, part of the claim, but also you have to identify whether this is regarding the original claim or a counterclaim. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, now part 36 offer will always be treated without prejudice, except as to costs. So it will be not presented to the court until after yeah. judgment and then it will as be... Presented that, that's the, right. So, so, so that's as I'd said earlier on this podcast, whereby that you will be making an offer, but it will be shielded on a without prejudice basis. So it's not for the eyes of the court until the end of proceedings, and then that means that the the mask is lifted, and then the court can consider this set these set of documents if need but need be, and they will then consider what um, you know what the, the 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 amount is that's being claimed against what it is that's been offered and whether it's reasonable and then there will be as i say a cost consequence um, as a result of that yeah so a part 36 offer is a uh, it needs to be taken a lot more seriously than just a uh, without prejudice offer because providing that it complies with part 36 it will carry costs consequences depending on when the offer was accepted and um, whether the award given was more advantageous than the offer or less advantageous than the offer. Okay, so on that point, let's just always remember that a without prejudice offer, which is, you know, without prejudice, save us to costs. It's not under part 36, but it is a without prejudice offer. There will, of course, still be, in the eyes of the court, a cost consequence, but the cost consequence of a part 36 offer are far, not are, they're likely to be far greater in terms of costs than that of a standard offer to settle and the reason being is that as Samuel was just saying there you're going to have to consider the point in time when the offer was made against the point in time of which it was either accepted or of course you know the court have, have, have made a determination there and there will be interest and percentages and all sorts of things that are far beyond what will be considered if the court is just looking at a standard without prejudice offer to settle. Yeah, so for example, if the claimant 
if the defendant puts in a part 36 offer and the claimant were to not accept it and then fails to obtain a more advantageous judgment. Okay, so let's just give give examples here. So let's just say it's a £20,000 claim. Yeah. Okay. The offer comes in from the defendant to say, look, I want this to be the end of this. So mm. because I want this to be the end of this, I am going to make you a part 36 offer of which I'm prepared to pay your damages as full and final settlement, including interest. This offer that I'm making you is going to be for £13,000. The claimant says, no, I'm going to keep going to court. I'm not willing to accept £13,000. I would want my 20 because that's absolutely how much is owed. Then we go to court and the court awards the claimant 14500 Now that is so close to the 13000 that was offered on a without prejudice basis under part 36, then therefore the award is not as advantageous no. as what it is that was offered. And that's what you're trying to get yeah. out there. Okay. So in such a situation, it will be seen as a, a, a court's time and costs have been wasted so the court can order that the claimant pay the defendant's costs which includes any recoverable pre-action costs from the date when the uh, relevant period expired on the Part 36 offer. So in actual fact, if there's an offer that comes in from the defendant, as you know, as the example we've given there, 13,000 and you know, claimant awards, you know, is awarded 14,500. It gets to the end. The claimant then gives a big, you know, big, big, you know, thumbs up and says, yes, I've, I've been successful. I always knew I would. It's not as much as I wanted, but I'm happy. And then suddenly the defendant's uh, counsel suddenly starts waving this part 36 offer under the judge's nose. That could have a cost consequence that's really damaging towards the claimant because suddenly there's costs from the point that it was made, that part 36 offer, up to the point of um, of the decision, that could be beyond the amount that the claimant has actually recovered. And therefore, it's ended up costing the claimant money to take said person to court or company. Incredible. Hence why you said that a part 36 offer is a lot more important. Yeah, it's a lot more, you have to take it consider it with a lot more seriousness and weigh up proportionality, the likelihood of what you would succeed in being awarded in court against what you've been offered. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, all right. But they are also important in a positive way for the claimant to make a Part 36 offer because if it's ignored and the defendant literally makes no offer at all, when they make no offer at all, they ignore it, they then go to court, they're going to be seen as being unreasonable, it is possible that that defendant can end up being in a far worse position than if they had taken that offer seriously. So immediately making a Part 36 offer, um, it must be taken seriously, or far more seriously than, than maybe some people are led to believe. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. We've had an awful lot of these going on at the moment. Some of them have been positive, some have been negative. And it leaves you with the question, where do we go from here? Now, everything is subjective. It depends on the circumstances. So do pick up the phone to us. Do give us uh, you know, a, a call if you're you know, looking at a, a situation where you're a litigant in person and you need legal representation and you wish to discuss it further. Um, and, uh, and we'll chat through it. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, we now need to go and get some fresh air because it is incredibly hot in here. So we're going to leave you all to your, uh, your weekends and um, take care and uh, we'll uh, be in touch soon. Give us a call though um, on 02380 235 979, email info at lordit.co.uk or you can actually go through the chat through our website and ask any questions there. Thanks very much.